Hey, I'm Ryan and today I'm going to be talking about mainstream trends and alienation. So I made a video on TikTok where I talked about how sometimes when there are fashion trends, people take them less literally and adopt the fashion trend, especially era based fashion trends outside of their mainstream contexts and put them into less literal, less conventional interpretations, and that's how they edit the trend. It feels good to signify something and have people be like, you are a fashionable person who is tuned into this fashion trend. It is way riskier to signal, signal something that most people will not accurately interpret. But that risk is a risk that some people are willing to take in the fashion and personal styling space, and that's what this whole video is about, essentially. Stay with me, buddy. I'm talking about these fashion tier memes that were really popular on Reddit and Twitter, especially during the quarantine. And what they identify is exactly what I'm talking about. When you first start getting interested in fashion, you know all the most famous fashion brands, Nike, Adidas, etc. And the more you learn about fashion, you start learning about these really exclusive niche subcultural areas of fashion until you get all the way down to the bottom and you're learning about CCP, which not a lot of people know about. And there's value in not a lot of people knowing about it. And we're going to talk about that. And I'll go through a couple of theorists, different perspectives on this. And it alienates the people who follow the trend in the mainstream because they would never think of wearing the clothes that way. They may not know a lot about how to do that. And so I was going to talk about it, I guess. It's really awkward to try to phrase this. That's part of why I wanted to make a longer form video because it's kind of hard to explain. Maybe I'll put the TikTok in, maybe not. Okay, so when I talk about people reinterpreting era-based trends, I feel like there are a few things to break down at first. One, what is an era-based trend? So that would refer to something like 80s fashion, 90s fashion. And then when I refer to mainstream trends, I just mean the way that most people take on and adopt a fashion trend or a fashion trend that exists with most people in the public. Like if I say the Y2K fashion trend, everybody knows what I'm talking about because it's a mainstream trend. If I say dressing authentic fishermen, maybe not everybody knows that, so it's not necessarily a mainstream trend. It's something that's growing and bubbling. Okay, so the mainstream interpretation of a mainstream trend refers to the way that most people take on a trend that everybody knows about. So again, the example I'm gonna use is Y2K. So think about when you think of Y2K, the fact that we're all pretty much thinking of the same references, or if I say even the McBling era or early 2000s fashion, we're all thinking of the same references because that is the mainstream interpretation of the trend. That is the way that we have seen it the most often. Those are the most um, visible images, right? Like we even think maybe of the exact same pictures, the exact same celebrities, the exact same cultural moments, right? From that era, because that's what everybody, that's in the cultural lexicon, that's what everybody's going to mentally. And that's what creates the mainstream construction of the trend. Everybody's looking at the same pictures. Everybody's thinking of the same things. We're all reading the same magazines or on the same websites or seeing the same viral tweets around these certain eras of fashion. And that constructs in our head the mainstream interpretation of the trend. And then we're also seeing those interpretations of the trend. So not only are we seeing the same 2002 picture of Destiny's Child or whatever, we're also seeing people dress like the 2002 picture of Destiny's Child all over Pinterest, Instagram, TikTok, Tumblr, etc. So that'll be like what's being sold at the major retailers as well. Oh, it was 90s in, early 2000s in? What is Urban Outfitters selling to most of the public who isn't going to take the time to research or buy authentic clothes from that era because this is way more accessible? That's the mainstream interpretation of the trend. Who wants to look out of date? Most people do not. And that's why it alienates mainstream trend followers when you take on these trends and signal to a small in-group of people by dressing like a regular person during that time. The social value of dressing in a way that is easily interpreted by most and valued by most, who wouldn't want to tap into that? Everybody gets you, you can be popular, you can be famous, you can be understood by many people. People can always compliment you every time you get dressed if you are playing to these era-based trends in a mainstream interpretive way. 
right? Who would give that up to signal to fewer people? You can say to three people, you get me, or you can say to 50 people. You don't even have to speak and they get it. Why would you want to speak to three people? You know, but that's a huge part of art. Friends, lucky find in my notes, I was getting ready to upload and I randomly found this. It's on internal status hierarchies and it's concept by Sarah Thornton from 1995. It says music taste and fashion language offer subcultural capital that members acquire in order to distinguish themselves on an internally devised scale of authenticity, building social status, demarcating their distance from the mainstream. So you get status from being away from the mainstream within the social hierarchy of the subculture you participate in. Throughout the video, I'm going to discuss the socio-spatial contexts that create this push away from the mainstream and subversive cultural contexts. Just know it's partly the internet and partly real life. Like the internet creates the mainstream at this point, which is so ironic because the internet used to be a place for dudes and dorks, but the internet is creating the mainstream, you know? It's like making art that everybody can accept and everybody can understand or choosing to risk sharing the most true part of yourself that you know not everybody will accept and not everybody will understand, but still choosing to share it anyway. Okay, I feel like some of this is self-explanatory, so sorry if this feels redundant or obvious, but I did want to talk about the theoretical reasons for why this happened. So I'm going to be reading from my notes on the book Fashionology from 2005 by Yunia Kawamira. Reading books is so funny because the way that I explain this on TikTok takes like three minutes to say it, but what they describe fashion as is relational, which makes sense. Like fashion exists in relationships uh, socially with other people. Fashion is social in nature. That is what constructs what fashion is. It's relational, right? So Tar describes fashion as able to be broken down into three distinct um, like systems. So there's invention, imitation, and then opposition. So invention is when like somebody who has a creative idea creates something, right? Obviously. Imitation is when that idea gets shared that was created and it pushes and pushes and pushes until something stops it. So what they describe that as is progressing toward the limit of the system until they come into contact with an obstacle. And that obstacle is the opposition. And then it says, as that relates to like class distinction, obviously the elite will initiate the trend, but obviously we have a scattered flow of fashion at this point. But in this example, the elite will create the trend, right? And then the masses imitate it um, so that they can get rid of class distinctions, right? Like, oh, I'm just like anybody who can afford or access this high fashion thing because now I have it too. So you tr you're trying to be rich and exclude me. I can participate in it even though I'm not rich, right? And that destroys the trend for them and it encourages them to uh, change trends. What does that mean? Let's break it down. Like that was so like, ugh. So when I say interpreting the summary of the trend, if the trend is early 2000s, you're dressing like it's early 2000s but not in the mainstream interpretation. You are still broadly participating in an era-based trend, but you're doing it in the most unconventional way that you can. Does that make sense? Hello, it's me. Okay, also to explain this, you have to step outside of binary thinking. So please don't think like there's one side and then the other side. This is like nuanced and goes in every single direction. Okay, so when you look at these two outfits, you automatically know it's early 2000s, right? It's like super obvious. There are tons of signifiers. If somebody looked like this today to you, you'd be like, you're an early 2000s fashion girly, right? But these are pictures that are also from the early 2000s. And if someone was dressed like this, you might not know that that's what they're trying to signal to you. You might just be like, that person's kind of out of date. They don't care about fashion. They're not a fashion girly, etc. And that is because there are fewer, very obvious, very distinct signifiers. Um, it looks less like a costume. Um, and so it takes more literacy in interpreting fashion codes to be able to identify what's happening there. Okay, well, I'm dressed like the early 2000s. Here is a less obvious form of signaling than the Blue Marine and Christina Aguilera, but still obvious signifiers, mini skirt, pink, Uggs, etc. Again, here's another picture from the actual early 2000s, but there are fewer signifiers, but they still could be interpreted by someone fashion literate. The Russian philosopher Bakhtin says, culture is a heteroglossia describing it as like clashing ideals and conventions that coexist in a dialogue or dialogic struggle to simultaneously keep things together and blow them apart. Meaning when you're looking at the subcultures, there are things that are interacting, clashing, 
contesting each other, but in existing in relationship with each other. So, so even though there are aspects of the way that she's fashioned an identity in this image that are coming back into fashion and we can see as stylish now, this wasn't the mainstream interpretation of mid 2000s fashion that we all thought of, partly because it's not necessarily the most mainstream image. This was already alternative at the time. It's not a con typical construction of femininity, et cetera. And these things all work together to create our understanding of her positioning in this fashion status. And so when I say it's based usually on digital or in real life subcultural identities, I'm usually talking about people who are a part of like discords, fashion servers, fashion forums, uh, certain niche areas of fashion interests online, like fashion TikTok, but specific areas of fashion TikTok, specific areas of high fashion Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, that may be closed off and even gatekept so that they can maintain the integrity of these subcultural identities. But also sometimes they're just like not what everybody wants to do. So nobody cares to like break into the gate. The goth and like alternative and scene subculture came back on TikTok in 2020. And so the mainstream versions of those alternative trends would be like e-boy, uh, goth or scene and it's just like the most mainstream interpretations of those like cultural trends and then the edit on that would be people wearing Rick Owens and then the edit on that would be people wearing undercover and then the edit on that would be people wearing CCP and then the edit on that is someone wearing an even more niche designer does that make sense so this like goth uh, alternative fashion style people took less mainstream and made it inaccessible because Rick Owens is a high luxury brand that's completely unaffordable for most of the public and also was not also known at the capacity that he is now. And then they would edit that to a smaller, less known, more fashion centered designer, less pop culture centered designer. And then they would edit that even more to a less known designer. And they just keep editing it and editing it to be less and less conventional. And I'll explain later why that happens. Boom, period. So the way that this can occur and the way that these trend participations can occur is through like online algorithmic agenda setting. If you are on a website, any website that recommends images, that is what also constructs a mainstream interpretation of the trend. A lot of people are like, well, how do I find what people used to wear back then? And people kept commenting, oh, go on. Redacted. This really, really helps. And I had to keep deleting comments. I'm a comment deleter. One thing about me, I'm going to delete a comment. I had to keep, keep deleting comments and I replied to the person, please do not listen to people telling you. Redacted. And other algorithmic websites are exactly what constructs these mainstream interpretations of the trends. You go on the app, it shows you images, and then it organizes similar images around it. And it is also showing anybody it can the same organization of images or working together to understand what images people like the most and then creating aesthetics out of those. That's what these algorithms are doing. They want you to be put in a box where you're ballet core or you're fairy grunge core. If you really want to see real thing, real beauty, you have to, you have to go there by walking and that is what creates these mainstream interpretations of the trends they're showing you the same images that they're showing everybody else who's engaging any of these images so that your brain thinks in a certain way so that you're more likely to shop in a certain way and when you are a pro like using conventional forms of um interacting online to find these images you're you're going to be conventional so that's like the one thing that i had to explain to people it would be really easy to market a music festival to you based on the analytics of who is most listened to on rap caviar and based on the artists on rap caviar these are the artists you're engaging the most it's an extremely popular playlist online it's a like globally famous playlist rap caviar all they have to do is see who has the highest engagement on that list and then put a list of those people on a um flyer and then sell you a music festival for rap and they already know they have a target audience that they've been you know marking the music to and it sells out instantly like that's what these that's what creates the mainstream <laughs> algorithm of listening e-girl edits on Shein and Fashion Nova like these are aesthetics rather than like subcultural communities they are based on transgressive subcultural communities, but they exist as mainstream fashion trends that you can just buy into. Less conventional avenues online give you more authentic, less often repeated iterations of existing within these fashion trends. And I'm gonna give you examples of those. 
Flickr is a photography website where people, regular people, take photos. They can do artistic photography, they can do concert photography, backstage at comedy shows, like anything you can imagine is on Flickr. It's kind of similar to Vimeo as a platform. It's a much less popular, much less often used website with Gen Z. So no one else in Gen Z is going to Flickr. They're all going to Pinterest, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, high fashion Twitter, etc. They are going on a website where real people take real photography of actual people and searching like 2005 friend and seeing an actual person in 2005 and how they're dressed. So if you watch a documentary from the era and look at people in the background, you're going to get a much less conventional way of representing that era. Again, I'll explain a little bit why. And that's why it's always gonna be the most mainstream interpretation of the trend because everybody's seeing the same ad and everybody's seeing the same pictures. <laughs> so more research and doing more work is much less common when it comes to interpreting fashion. Most people don't care. They're just like, what's trendy, what's in? And they go to the major retailers and buy from them. It's easier. It takes less effort. It's less effort, higher reward. Now I'm signaling that I'm in, I'm wearing the Y2K fashion just like everybody wants me to, like I'm fitting into the trend and I didn't have to do anything except walk into the store. Whereas there are some people who appreciate fashion and personal styling in a different way and they want to uh, be authentic to the trend, not because they care about authenticity, but because they want to alienate mainstream trend followers. Of course, it has some value to them to authentically represent the time period, but this is also connected to uh, larger signaling or more significant signaling in fashion where their larger desire is to just be different from what everybody else is doing. And authenticity is a really easy way to opt into uh, alienating mainstream trend followers because most people do not take the time to be authentic because they don't care um, and it's not so important to them. They also don't find that there's the reward in it that some people who are interested in fashion and personal styling find. Let's jump into the outcomes of this. Okay, the outcome is directly connected that identifiable costumes. <laughs> when somebody knows why you're dressing the way that you're dressing and they fully understand it, that has social value. And it's immediately understood during era based costume parties, Halloween, spirit days at school. When people do not understand your spirit day costume or cannot tell that you were dressed up for spirit day, it is so disheartening. By the way, for non American spirit day, so you are accurately and meaningfully signifying to other people that you're participating in something. And that is what fashion trends are even outside of the, co the context of costumes. People like when you can understand what they're doing and that is why people interpreted Y2K the way that they did. The mainstream interpretation of the trends, dressing like a celebrity, dressing like a film from that time, these are more culturally resonant signifiers in fashion than dressing like a regular person from that time. It feels good to signify something and have people be like, you are a fashionable person who is tuned into this fashion trend. It is way riskier to signal, signal something that most people will not accurately interpret. But that risk is a risk that some people are willing to take in the fashion and personal styling space. And that's what this whole video is about, essentially. That risk is the fun of fashion. So if I'm dressed like some guy in 2004, most of the population does not get that I'm trying intentionally to dress like some guy in 2004 because I am the fashion legend. Most people are just like, you are wearing pants that are out of style. Anyways, and then they look right past me. But a small in-group of people will understand that I'm intentionally dressing like it is 2004 and they will encode or decode, they will break down the fact that that's what I'm doing and it can foster community, conversation, understanding. And this is a highly uh, curated, I guess, form of, it, of communication to a small in-group of people and it can, it can feel like a more valuable form of communication to some people. Because so few people understand the language that you're speaking, it means more when one person understands it than when everybody understands something that everybody understands. Does that make sense? So when you're wearing Mean Girls, Mean Girls is one of the most popular films. Yes, a lot of people can interpret it. So you're speaking in a way that a lot of people get and a lot of people get it. Okay, that has some value. But if you're speaking in a way that few people tapped into fashion, art, and culture understand and few people get it, it slays because it means that you guys have more specific overlapping interests. Everybody has seen Mean Girls. Not everybody cares about 
maybe the same niche art films that this fashion style comes from, or maybe the same uh, music styles that this fashion style comes from. So it means that you have this really, really small selective in-group of people who may have more overlapping politics, cultural values, artistic interests, etc., as you, that you're speaking to when you get dressed in this way. An example would be that I'm wearing Ralph Simmons 2003 right now, and very few people, I'm sure, were able to identify it. It is a very subtle signifier on the side of my shirt that I'm wearing that, but the people who knew I was wearing that before I said that probably have a lot of overlapping fashion interests and tastes as me. It's a niche subcultural group, people who are interested in fashion and this kind of art and this kind of music and this kind of interpretation of youth and identity and ego, and they've probably contemplated the same things as me as far as whatever themes are in his work. That's what that kind of small communication is about. Now the in-group and out-group dynamic is something that I talk about a lot on TikTok. This is something that happens all of the time. Like this is not just something that is exclusive to Raph Simmons, Rick Owens, Andy Mula, Meester Margiela, uh, Heider Ackerman, ki kind of interested people. If somebody is wearing a shirt from their church and it says Sunrise Christian Church, or it has the symbol from their church. They are automatically signaling to people from their church, you go to my church, I go to your church. I don't know that, I don't know that that's a church. I don't have the time to encode all those symbols and words necessarily when I'm walking down the street. But if somebody also goes to that church and recognizes the shirt color, print, cut, etc., and then the symbols quickly, they're like, you go to my church. They are signaling to their in-group. This is not just something that elitist fashion snobs do, which is something I feel like I always have to explain um, because whenever I talk about this, people are like, well, who cares? Who cares? I don't wear clothes like that. I, it doesn't matter to me. I just wear whatever I feel like and whatever just is on the floor and da 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 It doesn't matter because even if you don't care or if you try to divest from fashion, you're still automatically always signaling to anybody. You, you could be wearing shorts from Target and a shirt from Old Navy. You might be signaling to moms who bought the same shirt and shorts for their son that that's what you're wearing. They'll, oh, my son has that shirt. You're automatically doing it. You have no choice. You can't get away from fashion. And that's why I love fashion as a form of communication. There's nothing that you can wear that isn't saying something. If you're wearing nothing, that's also saying something, you know? Every part of the way that you fashion an identity and don't is saying something and communicating all the time. Isn't that so cool? And that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So I'm going to read some quotes from my favorite book, Fashioning Identity by Maria McKinney Valentine, um, Status Ambivalence, Dress and Fashion Research. Okay. It says the social exercise included in fashioning identity relies on fashion literacy, deciphering sartorial assemblages within the framework of shifts in taste preferences. Does that make sense? So in order to understand fashion or style or any part of like the way that we create identities, you have to have some degree of literacy. When I was in middle school and elementary school, people would wear these black wristbands all around their wrists. Some celebrities would and they had different meanings at different schools or in different aspects of culture. Some kids were not allowed to wear these black rubber wristbands because it symbolized like participations in certain behaviors. But you would have to know that to ban that. And that's like what fashion literacy can be. Another quote that I think is really beautiful, it says, even though it, even though fashion is a potent tool for the spectacle of identity, we're so much more than how we manage our appearance. And that's also true. It's a partial extension of ourselves. That's my summary. It says, so though our ability to reflect inward desires on our avatars is important, the ways in which we change our appearance are limited reflections of our personhood. It is only a partial extension of ourselves. Extension in quotes. That slays. That slays. So it's about social messaging and then the group belonging that comes of that social messaging. When I dress and look like this, there are so many people in New York City, in the gay club, that understand larger parts of me that I'm not communicating outwardly. And that's meaningful. It means that I have some degree of social belonging and acceptance and understanding with my signaling before I even speak. But I think the, the point that I made in the quote before that, that I read, is that it doesn't really, it's not all encompassing, which we're gonna talk about in a bit. It's not all encompassing. Sometimes it can be wrong. Sometimes you can be signaling and it's not exactly what people think. 
The next quote says, fashioning identity is partly about scrambling for attention, not in a verbatim translation of visual expressions, but rather a sartorial trick or status ploy to be read by the fashion literate who deliberate, while deliberately misguiding those less versed in cracking dress codes. It is about social belonging and individual distinction simultaneously. That is the dialectic, sartorial dialectic of identity that you exist between at all times. The people who fully get you and the people who do not get you at all, you cannot escape one or the other one. We cannot escape, we cannot get out. You can't. You are always in between those two. That is where you are opposed. Like that's where you exist between. Okay. And this is another, this is the way that I explained it. Okay, it says symbolic, I, this is page 21. <clears throat> symbolic identity construction, for example, wearing a conspicuously dated dress can be a deliberate fashion flaw of re resorting to some other form of vestimental imperfection for the purpose of enhancing status. This is something I'm gonna address later, but this is essentially what I'm describing. The reason why it's so alienating of people who follow mainstream trends is who wants to look out of date? I think that's a, the huge part about this that I missed, so I'm gonna clap it. There's the risk that people are doing it not genuinely and they're doing it for that kind of like pretentious acceptance. And I think that that's like also really funny and cool. And I think that that desperation that people have uh, of being accepted by these elitist, pretentious fashion and art people, it's also a form of self-expression. It's like that you want to be accepted by people that you, whose opinions and taste um, sartorial sensibilities that you value. I think that that's also a vulnerable thing to do, even though it's fake. Uh, it's vulnerable and honest in some ways like wanting to be accepted to me especially in fashion uh, is something I love studying because I think it's so true and so real so true and so real I think wanting to be accepted and who you want to be accepted by on either side or in anywhere in between it, it's such an interesting thing to study because it's 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 an examination of humanity and like what at our core makes us us why do you want to be accepted by people who like Raph Simmons? Why do you want to be accepted by people who like Urban Outfitters? Why do you want to be accepted by people who like a niche musical artist? Why do you want to be accepted by people who like Harry Styles? Why? I don't think anything is wrong or right necessarily with some of these things I'm talking about. It's interesting to find out why. Pulling back. Let's get to the second page so we can wrap this video up, Miss Thing Honey. Sorry, Audrey. Um, they're decontextualized from their- Oh my god, that was so scary. I said this before, but sometimes younger people do not understand the degree to which they are fa meme illiterate because it's just something they've grown up with. In order to understand the current memes, and again, this is something I talked to Joan of Arc, uh, the famous meme page owner, about. In order to understand the current memes, you have to have known very often the past memes, the explorations of that meme, and the different iterations of that meme, the way that that meme was remixed, the way that the memes before it were remixed, and how those memes intersect and overlap, and how the history of memes has gone from your childhood all the way until now. You have to have like meme literacy. You have to speak meme. You have to understand the memes that flopped and didn't work. And sometimes people will do memes that flopped and didn't work to make fun of the fact that nobody likes those memes and that they don't make sense and that they're stupid. And that's why it's funny. My most often used example of total alienation is Luke Blovad. They are a celebrity, a musician, an artist, and they're extremely stylish. And a lot of people appreciate what Luke Blovad does with fashion because it alienates any trend followers that would want to hop on their bandwagon and copy them. People don't want to copy this no matter how much visibility, clout, celebrity status, uh, acceptance from the fashion industry that Luke Blavad gets because people know the social and cultural consequences of dressing this way for themselves. They might not be able to pull it off. It isn't easy to pull off dressing this way with confidence and having people understand it. A lot of people did not understand Luke Blavad when they first came on the scene um, until much later. Then it started catching on. People would ask constantly, is this ironic? Are you joking? Are you being serious? This is a horrible outfit until they started getting that's kind of the point like this is someone's unique expression that nobody wants to copy and it's crossed so many different axes like gender age uh 
out of date fashion, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a combination of all of it at once. And it's just this really high level artistic way of representing one's fashion identity that I love. But there's a lot of intention and artful uh, creation in Luc Bovat's like personal style. This is something that happens in all aspects of culture. This is something that happened in thumbnails culture on YouTube. There would be like this pattern and wave of everybody doing like high contrast thumbnails in 2015 and that got played out. And that's what makes life fun. These changes, these culture shifts, moving a little bit sl slower would be fab, but this is, I think this is what makes fashion fun. This is what makes all of art fun. I kept repeating that it was fun, fun, fun over and over, but what I was trying to say is that these are larger reflections of what happens in culture and society and that's the value of them. The things change because culture changes, the world changes, our economics shift, right? Our politics shift. And these creative expressions shift to reflect those changes. And it helps you understand what's going on in society. These things don't happen for no reason, right? Like subcultures happen because of what's going on in the mainstream as far as like political violence and conservative ideologies that seek to maintain the status quo and hegemonic power. Like this is about reflecting the power shifts that people want to see. Um, and then those trickle down into people wanting to, you know, divest from what goes on in the mainstream politically, socially, culturally, racially, you know, they want to maintain the integrity of a culture that says we don't like what goes on in the mainstream because it makes people feel like you have to be one way and we should be able to be expressing ourselves in all these different ways. Once something becomes mainstream, it makes you feel like that's what you have to do and it enforces that it happens with slang as well but yeah it's just it's just the coolest thing ever and i thank you guys so much for letting me expand on this you obviously can tell that i wanted to talk a lot about this like girl not the essay but you know what i mean like this is super important to me and i love talking about it and i haven't been on youtube in a while even though i said i would and i'm happy to talk about this stuff and I'm happy for all the things in my life that have happened because people have given me the space and opportunity to talk about fashion. Um, and I couldn't be more thankful. Like I literally never thought my life would look like, I mean, I kind of did like period, but you know what I mean? Like also quick, also sudden, and I'm so grateful for all of it. I didn't think I would have this much love and happiness. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna hope for, for my career goals, but I never thought I'd have so many friendships and so much love and so much happiness and so much support emotionally and understanding and fulfillment. Yeah, I love that. Love you guys. Um, thank you guys for being here, and I hope this was an interesting video. If not, I fucking quit YouTube. Like, actually, like...